screen. I've got to find it. Okay, so we're going to do cardiology now. Just wait for it to come up. Just waiting. Can I just check? We can all see that. Yes, um, yes Prof, you can see. Good, good. That's always a good start. Okay, so we're going to talk about cardiac nuclear medicine. So um, I'll, we'll have a break in the middle because it's quite a long talk, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, and obviously, to some degree, you guys know as much about this as I do because I'm sure you do plenty of it. So we're going to start off with some of the older stuff. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, radionuclide ventriculography or mugger imaging. Um, and then we're going to be talking about um, MPS and some of the other um, studies that we do. Okay, so I just... Whenever do you miss something? Uh, so we're going to start off with just a few slides on, on multiple gated acquisition or mugger scans. Um, to be honest, they're much less common now that we have widespread use of echocardiography. Um, but they are useful in terms of, of looking for global ejection fraction in a consistent way and tends to be used primarily in oncology. Though you can pick up other things like you can look for dyskinesia for ventricular aneurysms and look at global function. But with gated uh, myocardial perfusion studies such as gated MIBIs or gated PET. We tend to combine everything into a sort of gated MPS so we can get perfusion and function. So here is a um, classical gated study. Now if you remember what we do is we use the ECG lead to um, trigger the acquisition and each cardiac cycle is then split into 8, 12, 16 or 20 different sections Acquire images for about five minutes. Um, and what you then do is that you would then have um, a image of the what's actually happening in the blood pool. So for that, we need to label um, red cells, and that's normally done as an in vivo labeling of a pyrophosphate followed by patetinotate. And it's very simple, it works on the law of proportions. So um, activity is proportional to volume. So a change in activity equals a change of volume. So here you have um, the time activity curve. Now this is not time, this is the number of cardiac cycles. In this case, this is 32. And so um, what you have here is systole, then they have asystole, and that little tip at the bottom is, is atrial uh, movement uh, in patients who've got, who are in sinus rhythm. There are issues with this. Obviously, patients who have got um, cardiac arrhythmia, such as uncontrolled atrial fibrillation, um, it's very difficult to gate, even using uh, list mode. So again, that has reduced its usage. But it is used uh, widely in some research projects for looking at um, cardiac toxicity with chemotherapy, because they need an accurate measurement of what's happening from patient to patient. And particularly, it's useful for those who have been christing, which these days are primarily patients um, with lymphoma. Okay. So how does it compare with echo? Well, obviously, the big difference is that you can get an accurate and reproducible left ventricular ejection fraction. Um, but uh, you do need to do it properly. You need to acquire it correctly. And... Um, it does have obviously a, a, a small radiation dose. I mean, to be honest, the patient who's having got lymphoma, maybe having radiotherapy, uh, the number, the amount of radiation dose of three or four muggers is not particularly great. With echo, uh, the main thing is you need to have staff that are consistent. Um, these days, they're normally just specialist staff who just do echocardiography. Um, and they can be very good at what they're doing, but the problem is you need to get the same staff each time a single patient is imaged. There's obviously no radiation dose, and if you're looking at cardiology, you can see valve um, dysfunction at the same time. But the ejection fraction is not so accurately measured because it always assumes that the left ventricle is a pure ellipse, 
and I don't think there's ever a patient in which it's a pure ellipse. So that's the um, that's muggers. So then the next thing we're going to look at is something that is a bit old fashioned. So when I was training, we were just finishing off doing pyrophosphate imaging for acute MI because uh, the trope T test was coming, troponin T test was coming in, and we no longer needed to do pyrophosphate imaging. Um, but this has all changed due to this condition, which you may uh, be aware of, called ATTR amyloidosis or transthyretin amyloidosis. Now, this is a systemic disease due to um, laying down of various different proteins. And we're not sure why this happens, but it probably is related to some kind of genetic factor and also a trigger, which may be a viral illness or um, some other autoimmune condition. And this amyloid is laid down in various different organs. So you can get various problems in the eye, you get carpal tunnel syndrome, you can get um, spinal stenosis, um, it can cause lymphedema, um, you get um, swelling of the um, small and large bowel walls so that they don't longer absorb food properly. Um, but the one that obviously interests us is that you can get this particular amyloid um, being laid down in heart muscle. Now, to be honest, we were always pretty good at imaging this. We just didn't realize it. So if you do enough patients, elderly patients over 70, bone scintigraphy, you will get some who do have myocardial uptake. And we now know this is due to ATTR amyloidosis. Now, it is really important because if you have cardiac ATTR amyloidosis, your five-year death rate from heart failure is about 40%. So... To be honest, if the oncologist ignores your report and just carries on treating the patient with hormones, what's the point when there's a 40% five-year death rate from the cardiac disease? There is now a treatment for this called, I can never pronounce this, tafamidus, which not only stops new amyloid being laid down, but actually starts to dissolve the cardiac amyloid. And the reason this is important is because the best way to identify they've got this condition is with nuclear medicine. So there's a paper that was published back in 2005 from, the, from Paragini in Pisa. And he used pyrophosphate because we knew that pyrophosphate does have uptake in the heart. Now, we used to use pyrophosphate for bone scanning, but the bone uptake really wasn't very good. So we moved on to uh, bisphosphonates. But pyrophosphate is effectively a bone scanning agent. So what you're really looking at is the ratio of uptake in the heart compared to background soft tissue and bones. And um, Peregrini um, talks about um, four stages. So stage naught is where you don't see the heart at all. Stage two is where you see the heart Sorry, stage one, like stage naught is you don't see the heart at all. Stage one is where you can see the heart on the planar image and its activity is less than the sternum. In fact, it's also true if you look at it on the SPET study. Stage two is where you can see the heart and it's now the same as the bone uptake in the sternum. And stage three is where you can see the heart and it's got more activity than the sternum. So the easiest thing is to use the sternum as your uh, reference and compare to sternum. Again, the, the grading really works on planar, but obviously SPECT imaging will help you to confirm that the tracer uptake is within the myocardium. So grade naught is negative. Grade one is equivocal, and we normally recommend rescanning in 12 months. But grade two and three would suggest the patient does indeed have cardiac ATTR um, amyloidosis. And um, these patients should be considered for uh, treatment. Um, so this is a, a new area or an old area reinvented uh, for nuclear medicine. So there are now traces available, uh, pyrophosphate traces available. 
that you can do this with. It's a very uh, inexpensive radio pharmaceutical. Uh, and we normally recommend a whole body and a spect around about three hours um, to do this. So that's something which is old but now new. So let's move on to our main um, area we look at, which is myocard perfusion imaging. So this technique was developed in the 1960s, originally using planar imaging after stress and rest. The first agent used was thallium-201, um, but it didn't really become popular until SPECT turned up. Uh, and then in, by using SPECT, we were able to be more sensitive to the exercise-based ECG. And then as the technician agents came in, particularly MIBI in 1987, uh, maybe arrived and that made it much more um, usable because most of us can use technician labeled uh, isotopes. So why is it interesting? Well the interesting thing is is it, it can, can predict ischemia without causing ischemia. So this is a little cartoon from cardiology and what you can see here is if you go from um, sort of no stress to total stress you only need around about a 50, 40 to 50% reduction in blood flow for an MPI to be positive. Um, to get some dysfunction in the heart, you need about 60%. And to get um, significant changes on the exercise ECG, you need around about 90% ischemia, which only gives you another 10% before you've infarcted the patient's heart. So there is a safety margin there, which means it's really useful in patients who have other pathologies, such as um, diabetes or peripheral vascular disease, because you don't need to stress them as much. It also means we can use pharmacological stress instead of just physical stress. Now, if we were going to think about the perfect agent for MPS, what we want is one that has high uptake in myocardium, the uptake is proportional to blood flow. It has low background and very good dosimetry. And we can either choose one that has washouts and we could do stress and rest from the same picture or no washout with two injections. But what we'd like to have is a nice stable distribution from injection to imaging. Sadly, that agent doesn't exist. So what we have are a couple of agents. So the first one is thallium chloride, which is a metallic element which is a transition group 3A. It has biological similarities to potassium, even though it's not a group one element. It's a monovalent cation uh, produced in a cyclotron, uh, though there is a version of that, in which is 199, which it can be produced in the reactor, um, but isn't widely available. It decays by electron capture to uh, mercury, but that mercury has um, a fairly um, unstable and, and itself is a sort of metastable and decays, uh, releasing uh, particularly x-rays that we can image. The physical half-life is 73 hours, so that's three days. And the biological half-life is 10 days. So these patients can be radioactive for quite a long time after they have thallium. So the main um, uh, the main um, emission is a mercury x-ray uh, between 69 and 83 keV, that's about 90%, and 10% of it is gamma rays from the actual thallium itself. One of the big advantages is that you don't need to have any radiopharmacy, you just buy the vial, pull out the relevant amount of thallium and inject it into the patient. It has a pretty fast um, first pass extraction, slightly higher at rest than at stress. Um, and around about three to 4% of what you inject is taken up into the myocardium. Um, it does have a slight issue in the fact that it is not a pure um, uh, perfusion agent. In fact, at very high flow rates, extraction can decrease a bit. Accumulation retention depends on the coronary flow and cellular viability, but it does redistribute. It moves in and out of the myocardial cells. Um, there is excretion around ovaries and through the um, kidneys and also bone surface, those are critical organs for dosimetry. So you have this early component with a half-life of about four hours and then a delay component. Um, but it does disappear from the blood pool quite quickly. 
So about five minutes after you've injected it, you can just get a good quality scan. The other thing which is pretty unique is that lung uptake is proportional to the left ventricular end diastolic pressure, which is very useful in patients who have left ventricular dysfunction. But you have to be really good when you're doing your imaging protocol, because if you wait too long between stress and imaging, it will redistribute and you'll miss ischemia. So what you need to try and do is get the patient from wherever you're stressing them to scanning within five minutes. Now with pharmacological stress, that's not difficult because you could give them stress on the gamma camera bed and then just position them um, immediately afterwards. But if you're using um, physical exercise, you need to have your exercise uh, machine very close to your um, uh, gamma camera. Um, to give an idea of radiation dose, um, a standard 80 megabecquerel study is about 80 millisieverts, which is one of the higher doses that we can give, as it's excreted through gut and urine. Uh, because of this um, unfortunately high dose symmetry, we can't give vast amounts of activity, so we are limited um, in most places to about 80 megabecquerels. There is a good signal to background ratio, but the count density is not high which makes gating quite difficult um, and so as a consequence generally people don't gate thallium. Now I just want to show you this is a picture of a couple of patients who have increased lung uptake and this is due to an elevated left ventricular end diastolic pressure. This clears after about an hour so if you think it's happening what you do is you do the normal spec acquisition and then you do an anterior planar for about three minutes and you'll see when not those significant lung uptake. Um, and this again has a good prognostic uh, feature. So what about the technician agents? Well, the most common one is MIBI, as we know it's lipophilic monovalence cation. Uh, the technician is generator produced. We have a gamma emission at 140, which is less attenuation than the X-rays from um, thallium. The physical half-life of the techie is six hours, but the biological half-life of the MIBI is much longer. Uh, it's 10 or 11 hours, so it doesn't effectively redistribute. So you do need to do an injection at stress, another one at rest. Um, but it does have good myocardial uptake, um, and um, the radiation dose is much less. So as we said before, because we're using the higher energy photons, we have less issue with attenuation. Um, it is actively taken up into myocytes and then stored in the mitochondria. Um, it's bound onto proteins within the uh, mitochondria, so it's fairly stable. Only about 10 to 15 percent redistribute. It's around, unlike thallium, where it's about 80 percent. The first pass extraction is less than thallium, but uh, you can get over that by injecting more activity. Only about 2% um, of the injected dose localizes in the heart. But if you think if you can inject 10 times more, then you're going to get, even if it's only half the extraction rate, you're going to get five times more counts. Um, you can have a flexible um, imaging protocol. We normally like to wait until um, we've got clearance, for example, of, of liver, biliary, and some stomach activity. So most of the time we scan 45 to 75 minutes post uh, injection of MIBI. Uh, but there is a, um, it's not quite as linear extraction. So at low uh, flow rates, extraction drops off and it plateaus at higher um, flow rates. So it's not such a perfect perfusion agent as thallium. The whole body effective dose is much less. So if you're doing 500 megabecquerels stress, 500 megabecquerels rest on different days, your total radiation dose is about 8.7 millisieverts, which is under half that of thallium. And the primary route of excretion is hepatobiliary. Um, in fact, it excretes about 30% in the first hour, which is why we wait about an hour before we scan. The critical organs are the gallbladder, kidneys, and colon. The only problem with MIBI is that when it's prepared, there is a boiling stage which needs to be completed, which can take about 20 minutes. Tetraphosphine was popular when MIBI was expensive. Um, in the 1990s, MIBI uh, was still on patent, so it was very expensive. So Tetraphosphine was quite popular. Very similar, really. Um, 
to Mibi, but didn't require boiling for preparation. But when Mibi came off patent around about 2002, the price of Mibi dropped by around about 10 to 10% of the previous price. Can anybody could make and sell it. And most people now use Mibi. Uh, it's very similar radiation dose. As I said, the preparation doesn't require boiling, which used to help radio pharmacies. Other agents have been um, suggested, but none of them have really been used, partly because some of them were quite toxic. Um, and also, turboxing uh, washed out so fast um, that you needed a triple-headed gamma camera, uh, which or doesn't exist today to actually image the patient. So if you look at the practical differences, thallium has a single injection, low energy x-rays, patient has to be stressed next to the camera, but probably better looking at viability. Mibi and tetraphosphine requires two injections, higher energy gamma rays, so better for patients a bit more chunky, a bit like me. Uh, patient can be stressed away from the camera, maybe in the cardiology department, then come down to new for scanning and is much better for gating. So this is a classical protocol for thallium imaging. We stress the patient and then we do stress imaging after about five minutes and then we do redistribution imaging without any further injection about three to four hours later. With MIBI, uh, you can do a one day protocol um, and there is argument whether we do rest first or stress first. Most centers try and do stress first if they can because if the stress is normal, they can drop the rest image and the patient could go home and you can do something else in the afternoon. So to do this, you need to have um, much more activity at rest than stress. So you inject 250 megabecquerels of either maybe or tetraphosphine after stress, at the minute, sorry, at peak stress. You then give a fatty meal, and that could be creamy milk, cheese sandwich, Mars bar, uh, the British favorite is called a sausage roll, which is um, basically um, a, an excuse for eating basically a tube of fat, but it tastes quite nice for some of our patients. Um, for patients who don't like savory, you can have a nice donut. That's quite fatty. And to compensate for the fact you give less activity, you use a longer imaging time. So the imaging time for the um, stress can be up to 45 minutes. You wait a couple of hours and then you inject three times the amount of maybe um, Again, you have to give a second fatty meal. Patients quite like that. And then um, you do the rest imaging, which can be much shorter, maybe 15 minutes or so. For a two-hour, uh, two-day protocol, it's much simpler in the fact that um, you just do the stress image you give the same amount of maybe a tetraphosphine between stress and rest, which is normally about 500 megabecquerels, remembering a fatty meal after each one. Um, and most centers, if they can, uh, try and do two day protocol, but it depends a little bit on where patients live. Now there has been a modification in the fact that with COVID where we try to avoid patients coming up to hospital too frequently, many centers have moved to a one day protocol. So what are we trying to do? Well, at stress, blood flow to the heart generally increases, but cannot increase where there's a stenotic vessel. So you get less flow down these arteries and these appear as a defect on the scan. Now, as we said, what we can predict ischemia without actually causing ischemia. So you don't need to have ECG changes or get to a maximum Bruce protocol to get a positive scan, which is useful if we're dealing with patients who may have other uh, medical issues. And at rest, then it should appear as normal. Now, in terms of stress, we're doing physical stress, then people do work based on what's called the Bruce Protocol. So Bruce was a physiologist who worked in the Canadian Air Force during the Second World War. So this was developed in the 1940s to try and predict um, who would have ischemic heart disease. And basically it starts off on a treadmill system. And as the treadmill, they should keep walking at three kilometers per hour, that's roughly two miles an hour uh, in old money. And you increase the gradient of the um, treadmill for the first three stages. And then what you do is you keep the treadmill gradient at roughly about the same amount 
and then you double the speed of the treadmill to six kilometers per hour. Uh, and then the next three stages, you increase the gradient and the speed at the same time. Uh, and normally this is programmed into the, the stress system until you finally end up at nine kilometers per hour at a 15 degree gradient, which is actually quite tough to do. Now the problem is, obviously this was designed for fit young men going into the Air Force. Uh, and if people are not particularly um, fit, then they may have difficulty completing this uh, protocol. So we have moved to pharmacological stress, and this is particularly for those patients who can't do physical stress, and they include the elderly, those with arthritis, peripheral vascular disease or diabetes, those who are anemic, for example, for assessment for renal transplant, and those patients that are generally unfit. And if you think of your average patient who has heart disease, they pretty well fit into one of those criteria. So many centers have abandoned using exercise ECG at all because um, very few of their patients fit the criteria for that. For pharmacological stress, we have um, the main agents are the um, adenosine receptor agents, dipyridamol, adenosine, and the new one, regadenosine, which is um, a very expensive form of adenosine, but doesn't have the peripheral side effects. Um, and for B2 receptors, these are basically inotropics. There's dobutamine and its expensive cousin, arbutamine. So this is the um, structure of adenosine. So adenosine is effectively a, a base. It's, if you think of uh, DNA, adenosine is one of the bases there. And it's a very simple structure. And this can be modified to, uh, for the drug like recodenosine. Now, the advantage of adenosine is a natural hormone, effectively. So it's the, the way the body stresses itself. So it has a mechanism to get rid of it very quickly. So it's metabolized very rapidly. So if a patient has a problem uh, on an adenosine infusion, if you stop that infusion, that problem normally would disappear very rapidly as the adenosine is broken down both within the um, heart and also peripherally. So how do they work? Well, they work in a different way in a way than stress. So stress works by the body producing more adenosine. So people that tell you that stress is a purer form of stress than um, adenosine are talking complete bunkum because in fact, physical stress works via adenosine. So why not just use the adenosine straight off? And what it does is it increases flow during diastole. Now what happens is when people exercise, their heart rate goes up and the amount of time you have for diastole, which is when you can fill your coronary arteries goes down so you want to dilate them to get as much flow as possible. And that's mediated through something called cyclic AMP. The problem is if you have an atherosclerotic vessel, such as one with a stenosis in, they do not dilate. So blood tends to be redirected down the normal vessels. So you get an apparent defect in the scan if you inject your radio tracer. And as we said, you only need a 50% drop in the perfusion of that tracer to see an abnormality on SPECT, but more than 90% to see electrical change on ECG. And this is just a little cartoon showing how adenosine works. Now, the only thing you have to watch is that the adenosine receptor is blocked, both by drugs such as theophylline, but also by caffeine. And everybody knows that coffee contains caffeine, but uh, tea contains caffeine, but I do agree, not rudibus tea, or at least in very small amounts. But it also can be present in some drugs, uh, particularly um, things like Pro Plus, um, some of the um, uh, headache treatments like Anadin Plus can contain caffeine, and obviously cola drinks contain caffeine as well, unless you buy the no caffeine version. Now decaffeinated coffee still contains quite a lot of caffeine, unfortunately. So we do ask patients to avoid this for at least eight hours before they actually come along for their test. Some centers um, are a bit more draconian, say 24 hours. Uh, but the most important thing is to, for them to remember not to have too much, uh, any caffeine for a minimum of eight hours uh, beforehand. <clears throat> so this is what actually happens. This is very interesting. So this is a graph of what happens to blood flow and this is between the epicardium and the endocardium 
And if you can look at the, uh, the graph with the little circles, the white circles, that is the normal blood flow at rest. Now this was done with dipyridamol, but dipyridamol works on the uh, adenosine receptors, so it's, it's like the same with adenosine. So the black squares are what happens to the heart flow when you give adenosine or dipyridamol. Now what you can see is that there's an increase in flow, which you can measure of around about three to four times. However, if you have a stenotic vessel, and that is the triangles, the blood flow doesn't increase to some degree, it decreases generally. Not by a great deal, but it does decrease. So what that means is, is that you get a differential flow between the normal vessel and the stenotic vessel, and that appears as your defect on your scan. So as we said, the adenosine works in A2 receptors directly. The plasma half-life is about 20 to 60 seconds. It vasodilates via cyclic AMP, but is contraindicated in asthma and third degree heart block. Now relative contraindications are wheezy bronchitis, i.e. the coughing that every patient who smokes has. And the smoking is your main risk factor. We don't want to exclude those patients so we get away with it. The basic answer, if they haven't had to use their vasodilator, uh, bronchodilators uh, in the last um, couple of weeks, they, so they're safe to, to uh, give. And that's not their regular bronchodilators, but extra top-ups. Secondary heart block is a relative contraindication, but if the patient's um, okay, what you do is you give it cautiously. Remember, if the patient goes into third-degree heart block, if you stop the adenosine pump, within about 30 seconds, their heart rate will come back to normal. They won't even lose consciousness, most patients. They may just feel a bit faint. Dipyridamol works by blocking reuptake of adenosine and its reuse within the body. It's given as a steady infusion over four minutes. Uh, and then uh, towards the end of that infusion, you, you give your MIBI or thallium. But symptoms can persist for about three to four hours. And the worst symptom is it gives you a very, very bad headache. But patients can also feel quite flushed and dilated and get abdominal pain as well. And likewise, you shouldn't give in asthma or third-degree heart block. Now, what we haven't talked about is dobutamine. So dobutamine is the stress that's safe to give in patients with asthma because obviously it's a mild bronchodilator, not bronchoconstrictor. Uh, and it tries to increase stroke volume. So um, we don't actually need to reach the maximum predicted heart rate with dobutamine because it's both a um, increases the heart rate, but also increases the work that the myocardium does uh, in each um, heartbeat. And so it's what we call a, an inotrope and a chronotrope. So normally we give it in a stepwise manner up to about 30 or 40 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And even if you don't reach predicted heart rate, that will, should give you sufficient stress. The contraindications are really where you have an unstable myocardium, either recent VF or the patient's known to have problems with dobutamine or critical aortic stenosis. The point is you can't stress the heart myocardium if they've got a critical aortic stenosis, either on a treadmill or with dobutamine. Uh, for that, you have to use um, adenosine. Uh, recent VT is a relative contraindication, but it depends how well controlled it is. So that's the stressing. In terms of requiring a good MPS image, uh, we need to have a good quality image for diagnosis. So what we've got to try and do is reduce patient movement. And that's very much more of a problem with thallium because the patient's just had their stress, gets on the scanner, can still be breathless. So as their breathing settles, their diaphragm stops moving as much and their heart can actually move across the screen. Something that's called creep. Um, there are all sorts of attenuation, um, movement correction programs that you can um, also use. Uh, most modern gamma camera systems have one, and these should be used if you need to. Also, you get differential um, attenuation. So um, in the anterior wall, you get breast attenuation in women, and in men, you get inferior wall attenuation. This is because men and women do have slightly different ways that they breathe uh, particularly at rest. 
in resting breathing, men tend to use their diaphragm, so it's thicker. In uh, resting breathing, women tend to use their intercostal muscles. So this is um, uh, a study uh, which is, shows inferior attenuation. Um, this is um, the stress and this is the rest, stress and rest. And at that point, you don't know if you're dealing with infarction or ischemia. This patient then had a CT-based attenuation correction done. And you can see that um, this, this is just the stress image and it all comes back to normal. So this quite marked def apparent defect in this uh, male patient was all due to attenuation. So the other thing that you can then add to maybe help you is to quantify your um, SPECT. And there are various different techniques for doing this. Um, the two most common are Cedar sinai and emery. What this does is it um, looks at the your myocardial infusion study and uh, tries to compare it to a, a normal population, uh, either male or female, certain age groups, normally in five-year groups. Um, if you buy the American ones, there's also sometimes a correction for people of uh, African origin versus uh, Europeans and people of Hispanic, that's South American and Asian and their Asian is not South Asian people from India and Pakistan, but East Asian people from China. So unless you have a large Chinese population, it's probably not worth using that part of their um, um, gender, you know, their batch controls. You also need to record the injection time activity and when that stress or rest. And what it tries to do is compare to these standards and tell you that there is a reduction of more than two and a half standard deviations as a defect and if it improves by one and a half standard deviations that's reperfusion and it does this by using a bullseye plot so a bullseye plot takes the short axis and it takes the apical short axis at the center and then it takes different short axis and adds it around the edge at the center so you build up concentric rings of data and that's called a bullseye plot. And here we have a bullseye plot in an emery system of a patient with an extensive inferior infarct. And the black areas are areas where there is more than 2.5 standard deviations less than expected. And you can see the difference between stress and rest. And this is what's called reversibility. Does it change significantly? And this will be mapped onto the stress image as a white square. And it says that though there's been a little bit of change, it's not significant. Now, I think these are used as aids to reporting, but you shouldn't just report the quantitative scans. You need to look at all the pictures. Now, the reason we do this is that myocardial infusion degree has a high negative predictive value. What that means is if you have a normal myocardial infusion syntography, then you're at low risk of dying of heart disease, even if you have an abnormal coronary angiogram. And it has been calculated that in Europe, if they um, used MPS to determine in every patient whether or not they are high or low risk, uh, they would save about 4 billion euros a year um, on, um, in the health system. And this was um, from something called the Empire Study, where they looked at the different kind of strategies, and the lowest cost strategy was to do an exercise ECG and MPS. And if you did that, you per patient, you were making a significant um, saving. The most expensive system was to use angiography. Now, this has changed slightly with CT angiogram, but CT angiograms uh, are still not inexpensive tests. And to be honest, they, they have, though they've made the cost of doing the angiography cheaper, um, they're still um, reasonably expensive, and MPS still can be a cost saving. So the other thing we can do with MPS is what we call risk stratification. Uh, and uh, for those of you who are male, you're more at risk than women at any age. Um, more for a high proportion of men die of heart disease than women, though um, women are catching up because they're smoking more and getting older. Smokers more at risk, high cholesterol more at risk, obviously diabetics more at risk. Um, even without any symptoms. And if they have a very poor hemodynamic response to stress, then they're at risk as well. The advantage of MPS in risk stratification, it gives good information on function, it's reproducible, 
and you're using a bullseye system and things like some scores, uh, stress, you can get some degree of quantification. So the risk of a cardiac event is linked to the volume of the myocardium at risk. So if you only have a very small amount of myocardium at risk, you can survive your heart attack. If it's a large area at risk, then you may not survive. And also, if you have more than one coronary artery territory at risk, again, because your chance of recovery is reduced, and if your ejection fraction at rest is reduced, that also increases risk, as does left ventricular dilatation and lung uptake of thallium, for example. So this work was first done nearly um, you know, 22 years ago, and this was with thallium, and again confirmed that increased lung activity at more than one coronary artery territory increased your risk, as did the size of the defects. And this was um, a sort of follow-up paper, uh, and this was looking uh, with both MIBI and thallium and showing that your risk of dying of a, an event uh, was very low if you were normal. It was 0.3% per year, which actually is about the same as anybody's risk of dying of a heart attack. If it's mildly abnormal, it's around about 1%, which is about double the baseline risk. If it was moderately abnormal and you didn't do anything, then it, the risk went up to 2 percent which is um, about four times normal if the patient had a stent or a cabg the risk went down a bit if it is severely abnormal on the mps then the risk was about five percent per annum which actually is actually quite a significant risk so if you can imagine over five years that means a quarter of these patients are dead unless they have a revascularization so um, it can the mps can give you some good prognostic data this is from the same paper looking at ejection fraction. And as the ejection fraction uh, reduced, you have more risk. And when that was combined with the MPS, that increased your risk. So if, for example, here, you had a mild or moderately abnormal MPS, but your ejection fraction was less than 45%, then you had a significant uh, risk of nearly 10% of having a, a cardiac death per year. That is a big risk, to be honest, one in 10. It went down a little bit in some severely abnormal, um, and we don't really understand why, but the paper said the problem is that these patients are probably just um, so sick is that they wouldn't have had an MPS. So the really sick patients went off without an MPS to have a coronary angiography. Ejection fraction itself is also in terms of volume. So the bigger your end systolic volume, again, the increased risk. So those patients with big floppy hearts with reduced ejection fraction and uh, end systolic volume of more than 70 mils. Again, the risk was 8 or 9% of a, a myocardial death. Um, people have been using some stress scores. Um, I know they're like doing those in Pretoria. And again, it's been shown that the higher your sum stress score, the increased chance of both an MI and cardiac um, death. So the higher the stress um, score is the higher your chance of dying. So all these are prognostic factors which you can get from an MPS. Now some um, machines and programs even have a sort of death rate written on the bottom. Um, that may not be entirely accurate because there are other factors as well, but it does give an idea what the risks will be. Sorry. So I'm going to break there because we've done sort of 45 minutes. Any questions at all? Um, and I'm also going to just stop sharing just for a second to um, stop the recording because...